from ABC News. This week with David Brinkley. Now from our Washington headquarters, here's David Brinkley. The hours pass and the threat of war comes closer. And at this hour, there is nothing in sight to stop it. Our country is deeply divided. So is Congress. It voted yesterday in the Senate to authorize the use of force to drive Iraq out of Kuwait, but the vote was far from overwhelming. 52 in favor of using force, 47 against it. And the Senate vote was highly partisan. Nearly all Republicans voting yes, most Democrats voting no. It was somewhat the same in the House vote. What is going to happen, and what does all this mean? We'll ask today's guests. The U.S. Secretary of Defense, Dick Cheney, Turgut Ozal, President of Turkey, the Senate Majority Leader, George Mitchell, Democrat, Maine, the Chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, Les Aspen, Democrat, Wisconsin, ABC News reports from Baghdad, Israel, and from the White House and the U.S. Congress, our background report from Barry Serafin, and our discussion here with George Will, Sam Donaldson, and Koki Roberts, here on our Sunday program. First, the news up to this minute. We're going to switch around to about half the world for reports from our own ABC people on scene, beginning with Gary Shepard in Baghdad. Gary? Good morning, David. Tell me, the tell main us what's event happening. here in Baghdad, uh, the uh, meeting this morning between uh, President Saddam Hussein and United Nations Secretary General uh, Perez de Cuellar. Uh, the Secretary General, uh, General arrived here last night, was uh, greeted by Foreign Minister Tarek Aziz. They had a, uh, a conference last evening. Uh, then this morning, uh, the first session, uh, we are told an unsuccessful meeting between uh, Saddam Hussein and Paris de Cuellar, a break for lunch, a second meeting this afternoon, which uh, perhaps is still going on, we, uh, we have not been told, and uh, we are now awaiting the results of that session, an 11th hour effort to avoid war in the Persian Gulf. Gary, is there any evidence of any progress being made in these meetings? Uh, no evidence so far, David. Uh, we were told by a reliable source that the uh, morning session was completely unsuccessful. Uh, they went back into a second meeting after a conference between Perez de Cuellar and PLO leader Yasser Arafat. Uh, so now we are waiting uh, a news conference. Uh, Perez de Cuellar promised he would uh, have some sort of uh, announcement for us before he leaves here, which will be later this evening. Gary, thank you. We'll be back for the news conference when it happens. Saddam Hussein has assured us that if he is attacked, if a war starts, he will immediately attack Israel. Israel has been preparing itself, and we are told it is ready. Here's ABC's Dean Reynolds in Israel. This afternoon, Defense Minister Moshe Ahrens inspected the Israeli Air Force, the vanguard of any retaliation against an Iraqi attack. But in Jerusalem, Deputy Secretary of State Lawrence Eagleburger was asking Israel to forego any retaliation, to rely on the U.S. to handle Iraq. It is a request Israel is rejecting. Israel will never give up its right to decide when and how to react in order to defend ourselves. People are getting ready. Plastic is going up around school windows and the last of the gas masks are being handed out. Palestinians are getting protection too. And today, demonstrating for peace in the Gulf, at least until the Israeli army showed up. Israel's main airport was jammed with people getting out. So that we can be safe. No. So we can be safe. The latest military assessment here is that there is now a 90% chance of war in the Gulf, and that if war does break out, a 99% chance that Iraq will try to attack this country. Dean Reynolds, ABC News, Tel Aviv. Dean, thank you. Now, ABC's John McQuethy has been traveling around with our Secretary of State, James Baker, including Geneva and his meeting with the Iraqi Foreign Minister, Tariq Aziz, who gave nothing. John? Fog in Ankara kept Secretary Baker from getting here last night, and during normal times, he might have skipped the stop because of the weather. But these are not normal times, and Turkey is considered a critical ally. 
Baker is here to tell Turkey's leaders of President Bush's timetable for war with Iraq if Saddam Hussein does not begin withdrawing by Tuesday. Turkey's president, Turgut Ozal, has said his country will not fight unless attacked. Still, he has moved 100,000 Turkish troops to the border with Iraq, and beyond that, there are hundreds of American warplanes here now, and it's anticipated these U.S. aircraft will play a major role in any air war against Iraq. Secretary Baker is here to make sure that Turkey's leaders understand exactly what George Bush has in mind, and perhaps more important, to solve any last-minute problems so that when and if there is a war, there will be no surprise hesitations from this important ally. John McWethy, ABC News, Ankara. John, thank you. Now one of our guests, the president of Turkey, Turgut Ozal, by satellite from Ankara, Turkey. Mr. President, thanks for coming in to talk with us. Yes. Now, how do, how do you assess the prospects for war? I think uh, yesterday, when I heard that U.S. Congress uh, 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 approved the war opportunity, I may give the uh, President Bush support about the uh, Iraqi invasion uh, of Kuwait. And I think the chances for peaceful solution, in my opinion, has increased. And let's wait to see what will come out of the Iraqi Congress meeting tomorrow. Did I understand you to say the chances for peace are increasing? Yes, it you has did. increased, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. good. We hear all sorts of reports about this. I will ask you, because you live next door to them. What do you think about the, uh, the uh, Iraqi army? How good is it? I don't want to say much about it, but uh, the, all the incidents uh, taking place in the uh, last few years uh, when they have a war with Iran, you can see that eight years war, everybody supported Iraqi, Iraq and Iraqi army. They use all type of U U.S. or Western uh, military hardware or uh, Russian military hardware against the uh, Iranians, which Iranians uh, did not have sufficient equipment, they were not successful in the last eight years, you see. And therefore, I do not rate very highly. Mr. President, you have your troops of your own on the border with Iraq. Do you expect to be attacked? You think there's a chance of your being I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't know, but this is, uh, this is a difficult thing to estimate because uh, in Iraq, there is no public opinion about it. One man decision, and nobody knows how uh, this uh, one man will decide. Wait. But we have sufficient forces in the border area. We have uh, put our, some of our strength, and uh, therefore, I, if there is an attack, we will retaliate. There is well, no way. Well, you have a unique means of retaliating, and that is the ability to cut off Iraq's water supply by damming the Euphrates River, right? No, I think that is not very right because uh, one thing Euphrates goes to not directly to Iraq, to Syria first. I see. Syria is a coalition partner. <laughs> that is impossible and that is not the, uh, the way to do it. Mr. President, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now ABC's Brit Hume at the White House. Brit? Good morning, David. Good morning. Uh, it's very quiet here this morning. The president waits at Camp David, uh, having not wanted to send any signal that uh, he's chewing his nails inside the White House this weekend. Uh, I think, however, that uh, on the grim side of this is the fact that by today it must be clear to nearly everyone that the uh, strict terms of the UN resolution will not be obeyed because there simply isn't time, as the president suggested yesterday, for Iraq to pull all of its forces out of Kuwait. So that's something that's a concern. What nobody here knows, and everybody here has just about given up on trying to read Saddam Hussein's mind, is whether this is a last flourish of defiance uh, prior to getting out, or whether he really has decided that he's going to stay there and call down upon uh, his forces, and possibly himself, the full fury of the American military. As best you can tell, is there any hope left at the White House for peace? Oh, I think there's a lot of hope left, David, because this is a situation where you can't read tea leaves, you can't judge by diplomatic missions. The normal measures that you would use to gauge a situation like this simply do not work because we're dealing with a decision in the hands of one man. We all know who that is, and nobody in the United States government is getting any information from him these days. Britt, thank you. Thanks very much. Now we're going to the U.S. Capitol, to the U.S. Congress, and to Cokie Roberts. 
who's there all the time. Coco, you know Congress about as well as anybody. What did you think of the debate yesterday and the votes? It was, it was a very impressive debate. It was three days of people really going on the record, speaking solemnly, seriously, and not in a very partisan or rancorous tone, uh, and people are taking the issues very seriously. But I, after the votes were over, I, I didn't sense any sense of, uh, of great exhilaration. I think that uh, people understand that what they've done here is, is vote for what, as the speaker called, a virtual declaration of war. It's the first time that's happened since Pearl Harbor. And uh, a sense that they certainly hope they've done the right thing, that they hope that it's sent a message that could uh, elicit peace but that they're not at all sure, and they're not at all sure what happens next. And that's a, that's a pretty frightening situation here. Koki, was it surprising that the vote was fairly close? Uh, Quite close in the Senate and fairly close in the House. It was not surprising by the time it came, but uh, it, it was a by and large partisan vote, and, and uh, the Senate is divided quite closely on partisan lines. Now, if, Koki, thank you. Now, come on down here to the studio because we're going to need you in a few minutes. Okay. Thanks a lot. Now some news reminiscent of the bad old days of the Cold War and the Soviet Union hanging on to its satellite states by force. In Lithuania's capital, Vilnius, Russian troops with tanks and machine guns opened fire on unarmed civilians guarding the town's television tower. ABC News' own television equipment in Vilnius was confiscated by Russian soldiers. But ABC's Jim Lorry had borrowed some pictures from Swedish television. The Russians left them alone. And here's Jim Lorry. Backed by dozens of tanks, their turrets swiveling menacingly, it was a well-planned two-pronged military assault just after two in the morning. It followed by less than two hours a pledge by Mikhail Gorbachev not to use further force. Soviet troops used a combination of smoke bombs, concussion grenades, blank and live ammunition to storm both the TV tower and TV studios. Thousands of unarmed Lithuanians had been forming a defensive shield. Some Lithuanians said they would rather die than sacrifice independence. More than a dozen did die. At least 150 were hospitalized. Some beaten, others shot at point-blank range. Some run over by tanks. All of Lithuania is in shock and dismay. People are now bracing for the complete destruction of the democratically elected Lithuanian government. Jim Laurie, ABC News, Vilnius, Lithuania. Jim, thank you. We'll be back with the rest of today's program in a moment. This week with David Brinkley, brought to you by ADM, supermarket to the world, and by GE. From satellites to medical systems, we bring good things to life. The Proctor National Bank is closed for the holiday. You have reached Lucci Plumbing. I am indisposed at the moment. Ever try to get help on a holiday or a weekend? It's nearly impossible. Unless you're calling one very special number. GE Answer Center, may I help you? 24 hours a day, even holidays, GE's Answer Center is there. Whether you're thinking of buying a GE appliance or already own one. My son just put marbles in the ice maker. Don't worry, ma'am. The I GE Answer Center never closes. Look what ADM Research has cooked up. A vegetarian patty that contains dietary fiber is low in fat and free of cholesterol. One that tastes so good that in England over 50 million of them were sold last year alone. It's a food made to meet the demands of vegetarians. And who knows where it may land next. ADM, supermarket to the world. If war comes, it'll be the first time in modern times Americans have had the choice of joining or staying out of war. As we have seen in the votes in Congress and elsewhere, the country is divided. Not divided in its support of our troops in the Arabian desert, but divided about the wisdom of sending them there to fight Iraq. Before we ask our guests for their views on this and why they hold them, with Jack Smith off today, here's our background report from Barry Serafin. Barry? David? Hopes for a peaceful resolution of the Gulf crisis rose when the talks between Secretary Baker and Foreign Minister Aziz stretched to six and a half hours. Then they plummeted. Regrettably, ladies and gentlemen, I heard nothing today that, in over six hours, I heard nothing that suggested to me 
any Iraqi flexibility whatsoever on complying with the United Nations Security Council resolutions. There have been too many Iraqi miscalculations. We have not made miscalculations. We are very well aware of the situation. Aziz even refused to carry a letter from President Bush back to Saddam Hussein. This was a, uh, a total stiff arm. This was a total rebuff. Fading hopes for diplomacy focused on UN Secretary General Javier Perez de Cuellar, who flew to Baghdad to try to persuade Saddam Hussein to pull out of Kuwait. But even as Perez de Cuellar was arriving, other diplomats, including Americans, were leaving Baghdad because of the threat of war. In Washington, most Iraqi embassy personnel were ordered to leave, a measure the State Department said to reduce the risk of terrorism. And there were warnings to Americans traveling abroad. In the event of military action involving the United States in the Persian Gulf, the threat of terrorism against American citizens would increase significantly. Secretary Baker had a warning for Iraq about trying to delay as the crisis reaches the brink. Let me be absolutely clear with all of you. We passed the brink at midnight on January 15th. Saddam Hussein was talking tough too, declaring that his battle-hardened veterans of the war with Iran would defeat untested infidels. But America's top military officers said things would be different this time. We will exploit Iraqi weaknesses with our strengths. They will not be dealing with 15-year-old Iranians being offered up as cannon fodder. As a military correspondent, retired Lieutenant General Bernard Trainer saw Iraqi troops in action against Iran. His assessment? We are not fighting a, an army that is in the class with the Germans or the Japanese of World War II or the Chinese or the Koreans in the Korean War, or indeed the Viet Cong or the Vietnamese. The chairman of the House Armed Services Committee predicted heavy use of air power and a short war. It's a campaign of weeks, and you're talking somewhere in the range of three to 5,000 casualties with 500 to 1,000 killed. Who seeks uh, recognition? While threats and war scenarios were being traded, Congress, with little partisanship but considerable passion, debated whether to authorize the president to go to war. And let's not pull the rug out from under the president at this last moment, at the 11th hour. This is not a war. We as a nation are prepared to fight. Not for oil, not for pride, not for anything else. Not now, not ever. The American people don't want war by confronting Saddam Hussein with a choice between leaving and living or staying and dying represents the last best chance for peace. When it was over, the president got his authorization. And the joint resolution is adopted. And this sends the clearest message to Iraq that it cannot scorn the January 15th deadline. With just two days left until that deadline, President Bush has cleared a major obstacle in Congress. But his biggest obstacle, Saddam Hussein, remains apparently unmoved. David? Mary, thank you. Coming next, Representative Les Aspen, Democrat, Wisconsin, Chairman of the House Armed Services Committee. And shortly, the Majority Leader of the U.S. Senate, George Mitchell, Democrat, Maine. And our Secretary of Defense, Dick Cheney, in a moment. Behind every accomplishment is a document that bridges the gap between what can be and what will be. Every moment's contribution, every detail plays a part. Putting it together, that's what Putting together documents that can change the world. Faxing, scanning, copying, printing. Xerox, the document Putting company. Together. Putting it together. People together, helping each other, will keep us growing strong. We go hand in hand, you and me. We are threads in the invisible tapestry. If we show that we care, we'll 
build dreams that we all can share. People helping people. At GE, it's part of everything we do, so that every product and service we provide is the best it can be. GE Answer Center, may I help you? To help you reach your dreams. We go hand in hand, you and me. We are friends in the invisible tapestry. If we show GE. that we care, we'll build dreams that we all can share. GE. Glad we could help. We bring, we're always next to for you. Monday, an ABC News special, War in the Gulf. On the eve of the deadline, questions still need to be answered. Peter Jennings reports on our motives, our allies, and the cost of winning. The time to know is now. Watch A Line in the Sand, War or Peace, an ABC News special, Monday. Chairman Aspen, thanks for coming. Happy Good to morning. have you. Good morning. Here with us, as you well know, are George Will and Sam Donaldson, both of ABC News. How did you vote yesterday in the House? I, I voted uh, for the resolution you used for. Yes. Why? Basically, I think that, uh, that it has come to the point where sanctions, to try and rely on sanctions, I think that uh, it, it, it just won't work. And I think that what you're seeing here in uh, Soviet Union really reinforces that. Um, we are going to, if we rely on sanctions, we could not say anything or do anything about what the Soviet Union is, is doing in Lithuania. Uh, in, in Lithuania because we try and hold this, uh, this coalition together. It's going to tie our foreign policy hands over the year, year and a half for sanctions to work. And I think that that means we'd have to be nice to China, even no matter what they did with the dissidents. We'd have to be nice to uh, Syria, no matter what happened in Lebanon, and we're going to have to be nice to the Soviet Union, no matter what they're doing about the, these republics that want to become independent. I just think that's another argument that says that over the long run here, this, this coalition we're going to put together is going to cause a lot of strain and a lot of stress. And so I thought that the sanctions option was really, had a very, very low probability of success. I have two questions, first about weapons and then about the way we might avoid using them. You're been in charge of buying a lot of these weapons. Now, in the modern world, when you go 15 years or so without a war, you're going into war with a whole bunch of weapons never used in anger. Absolutely. How confident are you that our smart weapons, our night fighting weapons, our, our, our laser guided munitions, that all of these will work in that environment now? I think that's a, a, a very, very good question, and of course, we don't know for sure. Now, there's some that have come up on the screen as being problem areas, the Apache helicopter, the M1 tank. Others, at least uh, from the people out there working them in the desert, there's been no reports that there may be a problem. But in the last analysis, I mean, all the tests in the world and all the laboratory tests and even the operational tests can't show how it's going to do in, a, in an actual war situation. So it could be a much longer war than people anticipate. I think not a much longer war. The, uh, I think we're talking about a war of weeks as opposed to months. Now let's talk about avoiding the war. The big question today comes down to who, what is Saddam Hussein? What's he want? Right. I like your opinion of this following question. If he pulls out, he has a bad press for a while, but he wins in a way. He's got his weapons, the oil flows, the weapons procurement goes on. He's still the big guy on the block in the Middle East. If he goes to war, he loses everything, and the Soviet Union's no longer there to replenish his arsenal. Why isn't that, I mean, what do we have to believe about Saddam Hussein to believe that he'd still go to war? Um, I think you'd have to believe that, uh, that he was in such a corner uh, and he was so shut off from reality uh, that he would uh, therefore really be ignoring all the available evidence. But he swatches CNN, he gets visited, Lord knows, by a steady stream of visitors telling him reality. Can we believe that? I, I don't know. I mean, there are a lot of experts on Iraq and on Saddam Hussein's psychology who believe that when push comes to shove at the last minute, he'll do a 180 and, uh, and pull out or do something. Well, um, my, let me tell you where I think this thing is coming out. I think that uh, right. now that the Congress has supported the resolution to bring this whole thing to a head early, which is in essence what we did, and how it comes out when we bring it to a head early depends upon Saddam Hussein. One possibility, of course, is still the diplomatic solution. Uh, Perez de Cuellar, uh, the Soviets, something like that. Something might happen, but he really has been and is and has been apparently continuing to stonewall on the diplomatic solution. The other is a mid-January Saddam Hussein surprise. 
I don't think if he stonewalls on all these diplomatic things that that means we go smoothly into a war. What I think that surprise? Saddam Hussein is going to come up some kind of a proposal, some unilateral move. Okay. Something no, no doubt designed to divide the coalition, something to stall for time, something that will make it hard to start a war immediately, something that will cause governments around the world to say, wait a minute, maybe it's being resolved. Okay. I, I think it, 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 there's a lot of mischief that can happen in the next uh, four or five days. A lot of people think that the scenario you just outlined is correct. All right, President Aspen, what do you do, however? It, do you let him stall? I think you don't let him stall, but, uh, but how you play it and how you do it depends upon what he proposes and how it plays out. It's, it's a little hard to, to lay out exactly the hand that the United States government should play until you see the proposal. But I think that the basic proposition here should be, look, he's, he's known since, uh, for, since uh, uh, November 30th that the deadline was January 15th, and we should not let him... Uh, divide the coalition and stall uh, right. in, in that kind of way. Well, if we go to war, what should be the war objectives? Now, the political objectives is to expel him from Kuwait. Yes. Should the war objectives be to march into Iraq to destroy Saddam Hussein? No. The war option, and I think these are the, the, the war objectives, is essentially to expel Saddam Hussein and the Iraqi forces from Kuwait and also, of course, to strike some strategic targets in Iraq that are important to do something about the, the chemicals, the biological, the nuclear uh, facilities that he has. I don't think that, in, in other words, if he pulls out of Kuwait, Secretary Baker has already said that that latter set of objectives is not our, we would not go to war for that alone. But clearly, if we go to war to get him out of Kuwait, that would be objective number one, but as a byproduct of already being at war, I think we would go and strike the, the chemical, biological, and nuclear targets. But he himself yeah. might survive to remain president of yes. Iraq. Yes, the, 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 the targeting does not include him as set per se. If he turns out and if he comes to, uh, if he's in the command headquarters, uh, then we will go after the command headquarters. If he's in his presidential retreat, summer retreat, uh, we do not go after well, the president. Well, why if we would try to strike Gaddafi's tent, Time is up. why we wouldn't try to strike I don't know. All I know is what bunker. I think that you cannot do that explicitly. If he happens to be in the uh, in the right facilities, those that we are targeting, I think that's one thing. But it should not be that we target military leaders as, as, as a special targeting set. Mr. Aspen, thank you. Thank Thanks you very, very much for coming. Pleasure to have you. Thank you. Come again when we know more. All right. Coming next, Senator George Mitchell, Democrat, Maine, the majority leader of the Senate. And shortly, our Secretary of Defense, Dick Cheney, in a moment. Beautiful, isn't it? The Family Farm, owned and operated by men and women who are motivated by pride and a deep love of the land. Parents who pass on the knowledge and tradition of farming to their children. But the Family Farm is much more than picturesque. It is one of America's strongest resources, the most productive farm system in the world. The American farmer is also a steward of the land, using modern tillage practices to ensure the land will be productive in the generations to come. Why do we at ADM care so much about the family farm? Because we depend on its high productivity in order to fulfill our role as supermarket to the world. This week with David Brinkley, we'll continue in a moment. What are the remaining options to avoid war? Monday updates on the Gulf crisis, the critical decisions facing President Bush and Iraq Saddam Hussein. You're on Good Morning America, Monday. Now, for the first time on TV, a portable phone with hands-free convenience. Hello. Answer a call, make a call, without picking up that old telephone. Introducing Liberty Phone. This breakthrough in telecommunications is designed to make space-age technology your household companion. 
and so it's easy to use. Hey, it plugs in like here. any other phone. Filter, These comfortable headset buttons let you hear and to talk. You get clear reception from this tiny speaker on the red line. The blue line contains a microphone that uses ambient sound to carry your voice over the phone. Thanks to a price breakthrough, Liberty Phone is yours on this special TV offer for just $39.95. Call now. To order your Liberty phone, call 1-800-445-0100. Use your credit card to avoid COD charges or send check a money order for $39.95 plus $4 shipping and handling to Liberty Phone, Department 203, Canton, Ohio, 44750. Or call 1-800-445-0100. Star Trek, the original voyage, today at 5 on KNTV 11. Senator Mitchell, thanks for coming. My pleasure, David. Glad to have you with us. Now... On the votes in Congress yesterday, in the Senate, the a vote on authorizing the use of force, the Democrats voted no, 45 to 9. You were one of them. The Republicans voted yes, 43 to 2. How do you account for the partisan cast in this vote? It's not a party issue. It is not a party issue. And as majority leader, I made it clear to every Democrat that this was a matter of individual conscience and judgment. That's how it broke down. Uh, I felt very strongly that we should not authorize immediate war, that we should continue the policy of economic sanctions, diplomatic pressure, a blockade, which is what we're doing to enforce the sanctions uh, and to hold open the use of force should that become necessary. If immediate war does occur, it may well have been an unnecessary war. I believe we could achieve our objectives by other means that would be less costly. Are you pleased that almost all of the Democrats agreed with you? Well, uh, I personally uh, wish that the vote would have been a majority our way, but I accept the result. Ours is, of course, a democratic system in which the majority prevails. To an extraordinary degree, the debate in the Senate turned on a question of fact, and that is the effectiveness of sanctions. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, made the CIA's analysis controversial on the two sides. Two questions. Are you satisfied that the CIA has done a good job of analysis. And do you believe, as some, such as Fritz Hollings, believe, that the CIA in this case went beyond analysis to advocacy of policy? Uh, yes, I do. The objective reporting by the CIA, the facts presented were accurate. The subjective conclusions were, in fact, directly contrary to the facts presented. Uh, in the law, which I'm familiar with, there's a procedure called judgment notwithstanding the verdict. If all of the facts point one way, a verdict to the contrary will not be permitted to stand. In this case, in my judgment, the facts were overwhelmingly in one direction. The subjective conclusion was you, to the contrary. How do you account for that? Oh, I don't think there's anything surprising about it. Well, uh, I know, but not, let me hear you say it. What is it? It, it? It's very difficult for those involved in the gathering of intelligence to totally divorce themselves from the policy pursued by their superiors. Uh, that's not the first time. Indeed, it's been a commonplace event uh, in our system. It's one of the most difficult aspects of this entire process of gathering intelligence, analyzing intelligence, and making policy. It is, at least to me, murky how we stand now with regard to the War Powers Resolution. It says in the resolution passed that it does not supersede the War Powers right. Resolution. Has the clock started? That is, are we in a situation of imminent hostilities? And if so, what happens at the end of 60 days? Well, I think, uh, George, that is unclear. But I think the most significant result, other than the immediate prospect of war of this entire process, has been that the president has submitted himself to the authority of Congress in deciding but war. you are a judge uh, look yes. ahead and tell me what happens if after 60 days doesn't I, congress have to do something well uh the president will deny as each president has since the war powers resolution was enacted that it applies here uh, and so we will get into that continuing constitutional problem which we're unable to resolve through the courts because they won't touch the do issue you? but i think it's very important that the c constitutional principle of the authority of the Congress to declare war has been asserted in this case. President Bush submitted a request in writing. He submitted himself to the authority of Congress. It's a very important conclusion in this process. What do you think you've authorized the president to do? Have you authorized him to fulfill the objectives of the UN resolutions, which somehow do seem to curtail the kind of war that would be fought? 
Or have you really authorized him to do anything he wants, including demand the unconditional surrender of the country, to raise Baghdad, to pursue with troops Saddam Hussein? Well, first, the uh, resolution clearly authorizes immediate war. It is the functional equivalent of a declaration of war. Of that, there can be no doubt. The circumstances in which force would be used, the manner, scope, and intensity plainly would be war. Those who voted for the resolution voted to authorize immediate war. By its terms, the resolution limits that to achievement of the UN resolutions. Now, the question is, of course, how far can you go to achieve that resolution? That's it is not. It, it, it is to expel Iraqi forces from Kuwait. That does not limit military force against the Iraqi forces in Kuwait. If military action against Iraq proper is a means to achieve the Iraqi withdrawal from Kuwait, then clearly it's authorized under this resolution. Well, everyone seems to understand that the first phase would be an air war. Yes. Uh, even the administration says we would maximize our assets, and that's air. Yes. But I suppose at some point, if we had to use ground troops to expel the Iraqis from Kuwait, would they stop at the border, say bye-bye? Uh, I'll tell you this, everyone else will stop at the border but Americans. First, uh, well, Americans, think should, was, let me Americans ask you should understand that this is going to be an American war. The, the so-called allied forces are very few in number, and except for the British, God bless them, our good allies, uh, there isn't going to be anybody else doing much well, fighting. That and seems fair, and there won't be anybody else go beyond the uh, uh, borders, I assure you of that. What do you mean? The Syrians have already said up front they're they not won't go, do They're it. not going to fight. Do you think the Saudis will mount offensive operations? Uh, they will not be a factor in the fighting. The Egyptians? They'll, they'll be there. The Egyptians say they'll fight, but they're banking on this being a very short war that will, pre that will preclude Mitchell. any necessity of their fighting. Senator this is, this will be, if it comes, and I hope and pray it doesn't, an American war. The casualties will be Americans, the deaths will be Americans, the cost will be American. No one should be under any illusions about that. You hope and pray it doesn't, but yes. what's your belief? Will it be war? Well, I don't know, obviously. I hope not. Uh, I think it will be an extremely unwise decision by Saddam Hussein to opt for war. He's made a series of serious mistakes. This could be his fatal mistake. Senator Mitchell, on that note, thank you very much for coming in thank today. We'll wait to see what happens. Come back when we know the outcome, will you? Thank you. Pleasure to have you. Coming next, our Secretary of Defense, the civilian head of all American armed forces, Dick Cheney, in a moment. Imagine your refrigerator with bigger door shelves for bigger bottles with leftovers left in quick serve trays for leftover space more space nearly 27 cubic feet and a door in the door for things you use more imagine GE's Space Center 27 He knows that, I know that, but do the fish know that? <laughs> because a Dean Witter broker earned the trust of David Moore more than 40 years ago, we were given the chance to earn his son's trust 30 years later and the trust of his grandson today. More important than the relationships we make is how long they last. There are many ways to measure success. Dean Witter measures it one investor at a time. Dean Witter, a member of the Sears Financial Network. West Beirut. This is Jerry Levin. There are now 13 Western hostages believed held in Lebanon. Nobody forced that assignment on him. He knew the risks. This is the story of one woman's crusade to win her husband's freedom. Marlo Thomas, David Dukes. This has to be talked about. I won't let him die. Held hostage. The Sis and Jerry Levin story, Sunday. Mr. Secretary, thank you for coming. Morning, David. Very pleased to have you. You're going to have a busy time ahead, I gather. Now, Saddam Hussein has called an emergency meeting of his parliament, which is a rubber stamp, for tomorrow. Do you have any facts, theories, information, guesswork about what that, what that is, what it means? I don't, uh, David. He's used them as a sounding board before a forum in which he can make various and sundry pronouncements, and maybe he has some announcement he wants to make. But all the reporting we've received so far this morning out of Baghdad uh, is that... Uh, there's been no progress in terms of the talks he's having with the UN Secretary General. Well, I would like now to ask you a question. I know you're not going to answer, but are we going to have a war? David, I don't know. answer who can. I don't know. Nobody can answer at this point except perhaps uh, Saddam Hussein. I think uh, 
there should be absolutely no doubt in his mind at this point about the determination of the president or the support uh, that he now has from the Congress. But uh, I would not want to predict what will happen. I simply don't know. Let me ask you about three things that are said to be facts. If they're facts, tell me so. If, and if so, tell me what they mean. He looted Kuwait City. That's not the behavior of a man who wants to stay there and make something of Kuwait. A lot of their arms depots are evidently behind the old Iraq border still. And when they redrew the borders, defining the new province of Kuwait, they defined it in a way that left in the new province, not in the new province rather, the two islands and the bit of the oil field. That looks to some people as though all along he has been planning a pullback to that small sliver that includes the islands and the oil fields. Is that a reasonable inference from those facts? Well, there are other facts that counter that, though. There's the, the fact of over 540,000 Iraqi troops in Kuwait, enormous fortifications, some 4,000 tanks, uh, the announcement yet again today out of Radio Baghdad that he considers Kuwait part of uh, Iraq and he will never let it go. So uh, we've had conflicting information and evidence before. He announced last August that he was about to withdraw from Kuwait, and of course he annexed it the next day. So it, it's... Uh, there's no evidence at this point, no physical evidence on the ground that he is, in fact, preparing to withdraw his forces. Linkage is in the air. Uh, this administration denies it, that it will have anything to do with it, but the connection between an Iraqi withdrawal and a subsequent international conference to coerce Israel, it's, uh, the Europeans love the idea. Hussein has talked about it. Tariq Aziz in, uh, in uh, Geneva talked only about the Palestinians. If Hussein comes out and says, well, okay, the Europeans and everyone's picking on me, all right, we'll do it and we'll have an international conference. Given that an international conference is part of America's idea anyway, would that not be de facto linkage? The George President's made it very clear that uh, linkage is unacceptable in this instance, that there should be no reward of any kind to Saddam Hussein for doing what he must do, which is comply with the UN Security but Council. But if he pulls out and the Europeans say, okay, international conference, and we've said all along it's our idea, no matter what you call it, it's going to look like, taste like, and smell like linkage. I come back again to the proposition that the UN Security Council resolutions are very explicit. They are the policy the United States is following. It's the, the policy of the coalition of those of us who deployed forces to the region. He must comply with those UN Security Council resolutions, period. Secretary, recently the Pentagon ordered 16,000 body bags. Is that a reflection of the number of dead you expect on the American side in a war? No, Sam, when uh, you deploy a force of this size, there are certain things that go with it in terms of medical facilities, food requirements, chemical warfare gear, ammunition, and um, an unfortunate part of preparing for that kind of eventuality is to deal with that problem as well. How many casualties do you expect? Nobody uh, can put a, a hard number on it, Sam. It depends very much on the kinds of assumptions you make. And you can make assumptions that produce a result uh, from a very small casualty rate to a very high casualty rate. Uh, no one of those uh, scenarios is probably any more credible than any of the others, so we've refrained from putting out any kind of a casualty estimate. You've said but recently that our war aims, objectives, would not be to occupy Iraq, would not be to destroy Iraq except for military targets. What about Saddam Hussein? Is he an objective? Uh, we've got a, a policy that uh, President Bush has followed and, and uh, previous presidents have followed, that uh, we do not uh, direct uh, the military capabilities of the United States at specific individuals. Um, that's not our business. Uh, if we use military force, we will do so to liberate Kuwait, uh, but uh, he has to understand there's no sanctuary inside Iraq for Iraqi forces. Uh, that does not mean we target him personally. But uh, clearly, um, there will be no sanctuaries inside Iraq. If he's in the command uh, center, a command and structure is part of a military target in a war that you always try to get. Again, Sam, I wouldn't want to speculate beyond what I've already said. There's a question yeah. about the role of Israel in this. Uh, Tariq Aziz said, we will certainly attack Israel if a war starts. To do that, they would need to hit them, I gather, primarily with Scud missiles. Can the United States, does it know where they are, and can it disarm those in the first moments of a war and so as to, in a way, insulate Israel? Well, of course, if you look at the map, Jordan is between Iraq and Israel. Um, about the only way the Iraqis could hit the Israelis would be by air or using their missile capability. Uh, I would not, <clears throat> if I were an Iraqi pilot, want to go up against Israeli air defenses. I don't think that's a very 
significant possibility. On the other hand, their ballistic missile capability, SCUDs and other variants of SCUDs, basically short-range systems, um, have been used in the past, are operational. He does have significant capability in that area, and that would be the main threat. So Mr. Eagleberger is in Israel asking them what? Is he asking them, is it our request that Israel, if struck, turn the other cheek and let us deal with this? It's in our interest, uh, given our historic and close relationship with the Israelis, to stay close to them through uh, these developments. They have, uh, I think, been very responsible up to now in terms of keeping their heads down. Uh, we, uh, given the fact that Saddam Hussein has repeatedly threatened to launch a strike against Israel and the expectation that he might try to, to shift the focus of the debate off uh, the emphasis on his invasion of Kuwait to rather the Arab-Israeli conflict, makes sense for us to, to consult, which is uh, exactly what we're doing. Mr. Can you imagine that Israel will sit there and not retaliate when attacked? Uh, if I were Saddam Hussein, I'm not sure I'd want to take that chance. Mr. Secretary, do you expect Gorbachev's crackdown against Lithuania to continue, and is there anything the United States can do about it? Well, Sam, I uh, think like all Americans, uh, have watched developments this morning in, in Lithuania uh, with a great sense of uh, sadness that uh, if, in fact, uh, Mr. Gorbachev has decided to uh, to resort to force, uh, to maintain uh, control over the Baltic republics, uh, to let the tanks roll, if you will. That clearly uh, sends a very terrible signal about to the prospects for future democratization and reform of the Soviet Union. Uh, it's a subject that is of deeply disturbing to the president, to all of us in the administration. And uh, at this point, we have not... Uh, I wouldn't want to predict. Uh, but but should what we? Happen. Should the United States do something in changing its policy? Are we launching a protest of any sort? What kind of a protest? Sam, first of all, um, I'm confident that uh, the president will have something to say about all of this later. What do you have to say? Uh, I am uh, in a position where I will be advising the president. I'll save my advice for the president. But there's no question. But what the the pattern we've seen in recent years of steadily improving U.S.-Soviet relations is put in jeopardy by virtue of the events in, in uh, Lithuania today. Do you still believe that Gorbachev will fail in his effort to reform the Soviet Union economically and will be ousted? If he uh, has made a decision that he clearly is going to opt for this kind of th force, use of force, <coughs> Uh, then it seems to me that that in and of itself will signal uh, failure in his efforts to reform the Soviet Union. Congress this week authorized the use of force sufficient to and for the purpose of achieving the UN resolutions, but the United States, uh, the Bush administration, in defining our objectives has always tended to go beyond what the UN has said, to have arms control dimensions with regard to disarming the arsenal that Hussein has, and perhaps some people think even to changing the regime. Say clearly now what American war aims are. Do they go beyond removal from Kuwait and restoration of that government? Uh, the two you cite specifically are the ones that uh, are front and center in terms of, of uh, our operations, uh, George. But obviously, if we have to use military force, then part of doing that in terms of protecting our own forces and minimizing our own casualties would also involve dealing with Saddam Hussein's military capabilities. Suppose the UN uh, said, okay, we will put in the blue helmets, a UN peacekeeping force, and you will get out of Saudi Arabia. Is that a fair trade? Kuwait. Um, no, well, Kuwait. No, I'm talking about the United States would get know, out. The question is, uh, is Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait? Yes. Uh, is he pulled back inside yes. Baghdad? Then uh, clearly we're interested, uh, as the President's made it clear, we're not interested in trying to maintain a <coughs> large U.S. ground presence in, in that part of the world, although we clearly would be interested in working with our friends in the region God to, is in the to, create, to create a new security system that will work. You just said large, however. Now, it, well, is it your contention ground that force. ground forces? Is it your contention that peace could be kept in the Middle East by the UN without the United States on the ground? No, I think it would require uh, a lot of work with the Gulf Coordination Council, the Gulf countries, the Saudis, the Egyptians, and others. And uh, I think we're prepared to work with them once this crisis is resolved to try to create a new security. Is the deadline of Tuesday midnight Eastern time or Gulf time? Eastern time. Mr. Secretary, thank you. Thank Thanks you, for coming. We wish you luck. Thank you. We all do. Coming next, our discussion here of topic A, almost the only topic around at the moment, and joining us will be Cokie Roberts of ABC News in a moment.
For as long as we've been pumping gasoline, we've been pumping poisonous carbon monoxide into our air. It wasn't a major problem at first. There were simply fewer cars on the road. But over the years, as we've pumped more gasoline, our carbon monoxide emissions have grown too. And even though today's cleaner burning cars have helped reduce carbon monoxide levels, the problem persists for everyone. But part of the solution is already here, pure grain ethanol fuels. Grain ethanol blends reduce deadly carbon monoxide emissions 25% or more and help hold down ozone pollution in our cities. And a detergent in ethanol keeps engines running cleanly. It's clear, the more pure grain ethanol blends we pump into our cars, the less carbon monoxide we pump into our lungs. ADM, supermarket to the world. The Subaru legacy is a lot larger than the older Subaru. But people still think we're small and boxy. The Subaru legacy is plush and comfortable. But people still think we're just basic transportation. With 93% registered in the last 10 years, still on the road. We hope our old image wears out a lot faster than our cars do. Listen to the trees. They're trying to tell us something about what our polluted air is doing to them and to us. Fortunately, there's an answer. Natural gas, the cleanest burning fossil fuel we have. It can help save the air and everything that lives in it. Listen to the trees, because air pollution is a problem hanging over all of us. Use natural gas and we'll all breathe easier. Pilots with alcohol problems. Pilots who admit to flying under the influence. Is your pilot flying high before your plane takes off? Prime time, Thursday. The threat of war is on all our minds. Until the Gulf crisis is over, ABC News is committed to reporting what's happening each night on Nightline with Ted Koppel. All right, no fooling around, no beating around the bush. Are we going to have a war? Are we going to be involved in a war? George, what do you think? 51-49 for war, but since every calculation, as seen by a rational Hussein, and I don't think he's irrational yet, says pull out and be the big man in the Middle East, it's still quite possible he'll do that. No, we won't have a war. George right. Bush will pull the trigger, no doubt about it. But Saddam Hussein, I agree with George, at the last moment will save himself. If he were a true Arab nationalist, then he might become a martyr. But I think he's out for himself and his own ability to continue to hold power. So I believe he will blink, and the strength of that, I think, will have no war. Gordon, I hope they're think? right. At this point, I think that uh, I think that there will be a war, at least uh, at least an air attack, and see see how he likes that. You mean one small air attack? Well, it's not a war. Well, one big air attack. Ah, well, if you mean a demonstration air attack, well, there's Bashra. How about the other arm? I don't know. I, I don't think you can stop it. I don't think you can fine tune an air attack like that. Once you start, you have to go on. All right. Next question. We have heard that Israel has been asked not to retaliate if attacked and leave the retaliation to us. Does anyone believe they would do that? I'm going to give you another on the one hand, on the other hand answer. On the right. one hand, uh, Israel is governed by extremely practical men and women, and they may understand, come to the conclusion that it's in their interest to stay out of it. On the other hand, graven and the Jewish memory in this century is the peril of relying on the kindness of strangers. It is part of their post-Holocaust ethic to defend themselves, and I and think a, that would prevail. And there's a third hand. If Yitzhak Shamir failed to respond to an attack on Israel, I would love to be the leader of the opposition. I would be the prime minister of Israel the next day. I think we'd have to go in very fast to defend them ourselves if we don't expect them to get in there and retaliate quickly. I don't see how we can do it physically. I do know and learned yesterday that the Israelis have the pilots of their warplanes sitting in the cockpits, mm. strapped in place, ready to take off. Well, they save 90 seconds that way, and they think 90 seconds in the case of an attack might be very important. That's how determined they are. Sounds now, like next they're question. retaliating. We all watched and listened to the uh, voting and the speeches in the Senate and the House yesterday. They voted uh, by a fairly narrow margin to support the war. How would you have voted, George, had you been a member? 
I probably would have voted in the end for the authorization of force, but with a long preamble before the vote explaining how wrong it was for the president to misdefine this interest as vital, to run up the deployment after November 8th to the point where the deployment itself became the policy and put us in a position where we now must vote for this as an attempt to prevent a war that must be win or lose, and we'll win it, disastrous. Sam? I would have voted for all the preamble resolutions that would have required waiting and the sanctions to work, but in the end, I would have joined George. I would have voted to support the president in this. I do not believe we ought to have a war for this purpose. Therefore, I would have not voted in a way that would have pleased none of my constituents. I probably wouldn't have been there the next time. Kogi? On Thursday, when the debate began, I would have definitely voted to support the authorization of the use of force on the basis that you can't let a president go up against a, a foe without that kind of support and, and on the hopes that it would make Saddam Hussein blink. By the time the debate was over, I had a lot of questions raised in my mind, and in the end, the final question was the one of, uh, would you sacrifice your son to this cause? I have a 22-year-old son. The answer to that question is no. Did I, I, I would have voted for the resolution, but with great reservations on my own part, that this war, this is not a war we should be in. But we have been on the scene, and we can't vote to undercut them. George? I would just recommend our viewers, if they want to see the Senate at its best, to get, say, Sam Nunn's speech against the resolution and Jack Danforth's speech in favor of the resolution, and you'll see just how close a call it came when two intelligent, reflective people came There was came almost down. no posturing up there, was there? It there. was It was a remarkable debate in every way. It really people was. People didn't call each other names. It was Congress at its best. And part of the reason is they don't know what the politically popular thing Time to do is. Time is up, is. folks. We'll be back in a moment. When cars burn gasoline, they emit poisonous carbon monoxide. The more cars, the more carbon monoxide. But now you can fight it, because a change to a high detergent fuel blended with pure grain ethanol can reduce carbon monoxide emissions by 25% or more. And that helps hold down ozone pollution in our cities. Now that's a breath of fresh air for everyone. ADM, supermarket to the world. In 1918, a small team of GE engineers set a new high-altitude record for an aircraft engine. What made it unusual was that they did it without an airplane. Back then, no plane could fly high enough to test a new turbo-supercharged engine. So they did the next best thing. They hauled it 14,000 feet up Pikes Peak. Several fits and starts, this remarkable new engine roared to life. And it is the same ingenuity and team spirit that has brought GE from America's first jet engine to the world's most advanced. Ladies and gentlemen, if you look out the left side of the cabin, you'll see Pikes Peak. Which proves when people work together, there's no telling to what heights they can soar. Finally, while we all wait to see what happens, ABC News will continue watching the Persian Gulf crisis 24 hours a day, and if there is anything new, we will bring it to you immediately. You can count on us. For all of us here, thank you. This week with David Brinkley, brought to you by GE. From aircraft engines to appliances, we bring good things to life. And by ADM, supermarket to the world. If you wish a transcript, send $5 to This Week with David Brinkley, 267 Broadway, New York, New York, 10007.